My name is Sarah Rodriguez. I'm here from ICE Public Affairs. Thank you, first of all, to the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office for hosting us here today. And now we will start with a brief program. Let me run you through it. We'll hear remarks from our featured speakers. I'll come back and I'll let you know that it's time to take any group photos you want while everyone's, you know, posed and watching you all and smiling. And um, then we will open it up for Q&A and then we'll break for any one-on-ones you all want to do afterward. Okay, here now, the Deputy Director of ICE, Mr. Thomas Holman. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, today's a good day for ICE. Today's a good day for Florida law enforcement. Today's a very good day for the residents of the state of Florida. Before I get started, I want to thank Sheriff Galtieri to my left and National Sheriff's Association and Jonathan Thompson for all their help in getting us to this announcement today. All the sheriffs and deputies here today play an important role in making initiatives like this useful and effective in our daily operations. And I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank you all for your assistance in getting to this point. I've said it before, but it bears repeating. Local partnerships and local cooperation are essential to our work and vital to ensuring public safety and strengthening national security. To that end, I'm pleased to announce that U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, known as ICE, has established a new basic ordering agreement called a BOA with 17 jurisdictions throughout the great state of Florida. These agreements will make communities here in the Sunshine State safer and more secure from criminal activity perpetrated by individuals with no legal standing to be in this country in the first place. Today's announcement is a result of increased collaboration between the National Sheriff's Association, the major county sheriff's associations, and ICE to help ensure dangerous criminal aliens are not released back into the community. The BOA process affords ICE up to 48 hours to pick up removable aliens after their scheduled release from state or local custody and reimburses the service provider, in this case, the local law enforcement jurisdiction, for that brief period of detention. These agreements facilitate greater cooperation between ICE and its local law enforcement partners throughout the country. It's important to know that entering into these agreements does not obligate either side to a specific amount of activity but rather they provide the legal framework for individual contracts to be efficiently managed. With a clear mandate to enforce law, ICE will continue seeking opportunities such as this to build new partnerships and strengthen cooperation with local partners. Not only is it our duty to enforce the nation's immigration laws, it is also incumbent upon us to act responsibly and look for fiscal efficiencies and other opportunities while carrying out our very important national security mission. Public safety and officer safety is paramount to me as the acting director of ICE. You've heard me say it many times. It is paramount to me as the acting director of ICE and as a U.S. citizen, as a husband, and as a father. Creating a lawful system where a criminal alien is taken into ICE custody and not only removed from the community that he go reoffend in, but removed from the country, strengthens law enforcement partnerships and has a direct immediate impact on public safety and the security of our communities. I truly respect the law enforcement partners in this room and across the country, everybody up here. I truly respect the law enforcement partners throughout the United States. For those who have chosen to put themselves in harm's way every day, today's agreement will help protect the law enforcement officers in this country, not only the community. For every criminal public safety threat that we can't take custody of in the safety and security of a county jail means one of our officers has to knock on a door. We got 52 names on the National Law Enforcement Monument in Washington, D.C. I don't want to add one more name because the criminal alien got released from a county jail and we could have took custody of him there. The men and women up here I honor, I honor law enforcement. The men and women in law enforcement chose a profession, nobody's getting rich in this profession, but they have chosen to get up every day, strap a gun to their hip, and leave the safety and security of their homes and their families to defend this nation and defend the community. This agreement will keep them a little bit safer, but this agreement will keep the citizens of Florida a lot safer. I want to thank you again for coming today. This is a big day. 
And at this time, I want to turn things over to Pinellas County Sheriff, Bob Gutierrez. Bob. Thank you, Director Holman. We're here today to address criminally illegal aliens and their adverse impact on public safety in our state and in our country. Now, be clear, there's plenty of room for broad discussion and debate on the complex illegal immigration topic. But what we are discussing today is not about people who are simply here illegally, and it's not about the politics of illegal immigration. It's entirely about public safety and law enforcement working together so that those we are sworn to protect do not unnecessarily become crime victims at the hands of the estimated one million criminal illegal aliens in the United States. Most sheriffs in this country believe that criminal illegal aliens are a, sub, a serious public safety threat and that we need to support ICE in its efforts to remove these criminal illegals from our country. Recently released statistics show that 94% of all aliens in federal custody are here illegally. And I believe the percentage in state and local custody is equally as high. It's obvious that criminal illegals are a threat to all of us. Immigration enforcement is solely the responsibility of the federal government, but public safety is the responsibility of all law enforcement officers. And local law enforcement must work with our federal partners to ensure that we never again face a Kate Steinle or a Sergio Martinez situation. Most everybody these days knows what the Kate Steinle situation was. Sergio Martinez was a guy who was released from a jail in Oregon last year. He shouldn't have been. He was an illegal alien who had been deported at least five times and had an extensive criminal history and he raped a 65-year-old woman. That shouldn't have happened. We must do all we can to ensure that ICE officers are able to take custody of these criminal illegals in the safest manner possible for the officers. Taking custody of someone already in a jail is always safer than chasing a criminal illegal down the street, getting in a car chase, or worse. Criminal illegal aliens simply should not be allowed to remain in this country and they should not enjoy any sanctuaries or other places where they can evade the laws of the United States. This is a country of laws and they must be followed by everyone. For over 25 years, ICE issued immigration detainers to local jails and through these detainers, ICE asked that we hold these criminal illegals so they can pick them up upon completion of their state charges as opposed to having to chase them down the street. Most sheriffs and county jails across the country gladly honored the request. Then in 2014, the federal courts held that the detainers did not provide lawful authority for sheriffs to hold these criminal illegals for ICE to pick up. After 2014 court decisions, many sheriffs stopped honoring the detainers and the previous administration made decisions and implemented policies that strained the relationship between the sheriffs and ICE. Sheriffs were between a rock and a hard place. We had to choose between releasing criminals from our jails to commit more crimes and victimize our communities or hold these illegal aliens and risk being sued and having to pay six-figure judgments for civil rights violations. Both options are bad places to be as a sheriff. In early 2017, President Trump entered an executive order that resulted in a broad ICE policy change. Under the revised detainer system, detainers were only to be issued based on probable cause that the alien was removable and all detainers had to be accompanied by arrest warrants. This was a move in the right direction, but there was and are legal impediments to local law enforcement serving these ICE arrest warrants. This re resulted in many sheriffs still being unable to honor the detainers. It also meant in many cases that criminals in this country illegally were returned to the streets where they committed more crimes and victimized our citizens. Sheriffs have been working very closely with our ICE partners for the last year on a solution that allows sheriffs to lawfully hold these criminal illegals in our jails for up to 48 hours after their state charges are resolved so that ICE has adequate time to take custody of these people. We've had to come up with this solution because Congress has not acted and change the laws that are necessary to close the gaps identified in the 2014 court decisions. The process we announced today, as Director Holman referenced, is a housing agreement between ICE and the sheriffs. Under federal law, ICE can contract with the sheriffs to house these illegal aliens. 
using the BOA or the basic ordering agreement, sheriffs and non-sheriff county jail operators will enter into these written agreements. And after the BOA is in place, and upon receipt of a booking form from ICE, we will hold these criminal illegals for up to 48 hours. Again, making sure they're not released back into the community to commit more crime. In the simplest form, this is an agreement between ICE and the sheriffs to hold these criminal illegals for which will be paid up to $50 for the 48 hour period. And it is a lawful solution that meets our collective legal and public safety needs. This is a great day for the rule of law in this country and sends a message that local law enforcement is unified with our federal partners to lawfully ensure the removal of criminal aliens. There must never again be a Kate Steinle or a Sergio Martinez situation, both of which can be easily prevented by the solution. So we again will begin immediately implementing the BOA process with 17 Florida Sheriff's offices and then roll it out to the rest of Florida and to other parts of the country in a time frame that we haven't yet identified, but hopefully it's sooner rather than later. Now as I close, I want to address two big misconceptions about this process that require clarification and emphasis. The first is that there are people out there who have and will claim that this process is not lawful because the warrants attached to the detainers are not issued by federal judges. This pre premise is blatantly false and creates a self-serving false narrative. These administrative warrants issued by ICE are in full compliance with the law and have up upheld by the courts. In fact, federal judges have absolutely no authority to issue warrants and for someone to claim otherwise is misleading and intellectually dishonest. Judge-issued warrants have no place in this process, and anyone who has an opinion otherwise needs to take it up with Congress. Because we follow the law, we don't make the law. The second misnomer is that some people we hold for ICE are not serious criminals and may have only committed minor crimes. To this I say, not so fast, and don't judge the book by its cover. Someone may be arrested on a traffic charge or disorderly conduct, but ICE looks at the totality of the circumstances in deciding whether to issue the detainer and book the person into our jail. In many cases, the person arrested for DUI or disorderly conduct has a significant criminal history that is the basis for ICE's actions and or the person has been deported many times previously and again re-entered our country. If someone's been deported, they shouldn't come back and they certainly shouldn't come back and commit crimes. Now, over here to my left, you'll see a couple of boards, and they're an example of this. The first person over there, Menendez, he was arrested by local law enforcement August 30th of 2017 on a drunk driving charge, DUI. ICE issued a detainer. Well, ICE issued the detainer, the background of this person was that he had been ordered, removed, or deported by an immigration judge twice in 2007 and again in 2013. With Santana, he was arrested in August of uh, 2017 for driving with a no valid driver's license. ICE again issued a detainer. Not only because of the traffic arrest, but because an immigration judge had ordered him deported in 2007 and 2010. He had prior convictions for battery domestic violence, for possession of drugs, for drunk driving, and for inflicting corporal in injury on a spouse. These people are here committing crimes. They didn't get the message when the judge said, get out, they came back. Both of them defied the law and these judges' orders and obviously didn't get the message. So on behalf of the major county sheriffs of America, the National Sheriffs Association, I thank the sheriffs of Florida who are here today and have agreed to participate in this solution and contribute to good public safety and policy in our state. And many, many thanks to Director Holman and his staff for their partnership and leadership in getting this solution implemented. And we look forward to continuing to work with Director Holman and ICE to keep America safe. Uh, I'll turn this over now to Sheriff Grady Judd as president of the Major County Sheriffs of America. Thank you, Sheriff. It's certainly my honor to be with you today on behalf of the Major County Sheriffs of America. I want you to know that we care first and foremost about the people of this country. We care about their safety and their security. And I'm here today telling you that the Major County Sheriffs of America, with Director Holman, is leading the way for a safer America. 
I appreciate Sheriff Gualteri, who is also our treasurer at the Major County Sheriff's Association, for being the subject matter expert and agreeing to chair the committee that worked with our, our partners at ICE. <laughs> Director Homan, without you, it never would have happened, and we appreciate you more than you know. We are working together for a safer America. This basic order and agreement is a return to the rule of law. We don't create the law. We don't interpret the law. The people of this country expect us to enforce the law. They expect us to enforce it fairly and equitably. And that's exactly what we do and what we're committing to you today that we're going to do. Today, with this BOA, we have clear direction. We'll be able to hold illegal criminal aliens accountable according to the law of this land, of this country. We'll be able to rid our counties and this country of those who illegally come here and victimize the people of the United States. But let me make this personal and tell you some instances just in my county where illegal aliens have committed crimes. But please don't think this is an isolated incident. My colleagues from around the state and from around the nation can all stand here today and give you the same examples in their communities. Let's first start with Lorenzo Martinez. Lorenzo Martinez, in the early morning hours of January the 17th in 2015, was illegally driving a car. And he hit 23-year-old Michael Mala, who was riding a scooter with such force that he knocked Michael half the length of a football field. And he died instantly there. If that's not enough, understand that Martinez was drinking and driving and fled the scene and abandoned the vehicle. But our deputies stood in the gap between good and evil and they risked their lives to take this man into custody. He pled, he pled guilty to DUI manslaughter and leaving the scene of a crash with death. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison. 50 years that you, the taxpayer, are paying for, and he should have never been here in the first place. He was sued in civil court. There's a judgment against him for $17 million. The family, the family of our victim will never even collect enough to bury their loved one. Now, here's the rest of the story. Martinez had encountered law enforcement officers on many times before. Between January the 11, uh, 2011 and July 2013, count them, we put him in jail five times on criminal charges to include inappropriately driving a vehicle without a license. Now I want you to ask my victim's family if he should have been here. Five times he flaunted the law. We're talking about criminals. And if that's not enough, how about Ronnie Mendez? He's 26. He repeatedly raped a 10-year-old child and impregnated her. He was here illegally at the time, but he self-deported magically when we started our investigation. So we tracked him down across the Southern Hemisphere and arrested him and brought him back. He was found guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole, which is where he should be since he committed the crime. But you, the taxpayer, are paying for him to lock him up in prison for the rest of his life 
for violent acts he did against children in this country and he should not have ever been here. Did I forget to mention to you, Ma Concepcion Lopez. She was arrested in March of 2014 along with 25 of her colleagues for trafficking in narcotics. She was the leader of the group. She was a businesswoman. It was illegal. A major organized methamphetamine trafficking distribution ring operating out of Florida. Our members, members of Haida, worked together and we locked her up. She took a plea. She went to prison for three years and then was deported by ICE. Guess what? ICE caught her again trying to come back across the border and they deported her a second time. And guess what? She came back for the third time. When she came back for the third time, she returned as the ringleader of the meth operation. She told the detectives at the time of her arrest, not only was she illegally here for the third time, but she said she was con collecting federal assistance. So let me get this right. She's here illegally, she's trafficking in methamphetamine, and she said she was getting federal assistance. Wow. Only in America that ignores criminal aliens. She's currently in state custody. She pled to a minimum mandatory 25 years. Once again, taxpayers across this country, you're paying for her to be locked up because we didn't give the support to ICE that they should have had. We didn't give the tools to ICE that they should have had. But we're standing here today to make it abundantly clear that we're gonna protect the people of this country and of our various counties that we are going to work with Director Homan and his law enforcement officers in order to enforce the law and simply live up to that oath that we took to support and protect the Constitution of the United States. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. I want to thank the, uh, the men and, and women in, in this room and behind me. This is probably one of the greatest honors I've had. Standing behind me and throughout Florida and across this country are 3,086 sheriffs that we represent. Overwhelmingly, they are elected by the people, by the taxpayers of this nation. Overwhelmingly, they are elected. Today's agreement makes our commitment and our communities neighborhoods and our nations safer, suffering will be reduced, and lives will be saved. The immigration detainer issue has been difficult and challenging. This new process clarifies that our members holding illegal, criminal illegal aliens, criminal illegal aliens in their jails and prisons are afforded liability protection from potential litigation. America's sheriffs Across the, share, across the nation want to participate with ICE. They want to protect their communities. They want to find the solution to this cornerstone problem. And ladies and gentlemen, the gentleman on my left and the gentleman on my right are a critical part of that. It was because of their personal tenacity, their commitment to their communities, to their officers, and to us that we're standing here. This agreement is possible not just because of these two, but because of every member of the law enforcement that is sworn to uphold that constitution that Sheriff Judd was talking about. This is what's called leadership in our nation. Taking a position, knowing that it's controversial, standing up for it, and yet again, moving ahead with the decision. The administration, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of Justice have all done what's right. They have worked tirelessly with us to achieve this agreement. 
I want to say this in the strongest of terms. We are a nation of laws. We live by the cornerstone belief in the rule of law. We have to. We must, because that is truly what makes this nation exceptional. But when we turn an, a blind eye to that law, when we choose to turn a blind eye, we put lives at risk, we put communities at risk, and we are all lesser because of it. In closing, let me say this. This is an historic day for a lot of us. Three years ago, I joined the National Sheriff's Association, and this was the number one most vexing problem that we faced. Then it became the opioid epidemic and others. But you cannot touch one without the other. We have opioids flowing across our border. And I do believe with the leadership of the Customs and Border Patrol Chief uh, Commissioner McLennan and Director Holman, we'll slow that flow. But let us all be honest with ourselves. It will never end. It will never stop. Our government, our state governments, have to take a stand. They have to be there when it counts. We were, and we will be. And we will continue to do so for whatever it takes. Ladies and gentlemen, I urge you to give these, po these folks, these two gentlemen, a very strong applause, because what they have done is historic. Thank you very much. God bless you all. I'll take your questions. I will also introduce you to Mr. Matthew Albans from Immigration and Customs Enforcement. He is the Executive Associate Director for Enforcement and Removal Operations. He is ICE's subject matter expert for this question and answer session. So please raise your hand, announce your name, your media outlet, and who the question is intended for. Chip Lutronowski, WFLA TV. I was, I'm calling. Hi, Hi I'm Mitch Perry, Ford of Politics. This is to be with for Sheriff Gutierrez. Perhaps. Um, this is going to roll out, you said, with 17 sheriffs in the state. Right. Um, after that, what's the process in terms of other counties and the, the state and the country? And do sheriffs have the uh, ability to ignore this? Is this a mandate? How's this going to work out? Well, it, it's not a mandate. It's not a legal mandate. Uh, I consider it a moral mandate because we need to do the right thing. And the dilemma has been for sheriffs is pick the worst of two situations. Put criminal illegals on the street and run the risk of a Kate Steinle or that woman who was raped in Portland and all the other scenarios that have played out tragically across this country or run the risk of being sued, violating somebody's civil rights. We provided a vehicle today to take that off the table. And so when that's taken off the table, there isn't a sheriff in this country that should choose to put a criminal illegal on the street. So to that extent, from that perspective, I view it as a mandate because we need to do the right thing. As far as moving forward, we want to roll this out as quickly as we possibly can to the remaining counties in Florida and give them an opportunity to participate. But we also want to make sure we do it right, and we do it effectively, we're doing it efficiently, and that the resources are in place. So we're going to start with these 17. And as soon as we're assured that the process is flowing smoothly, then we'll roll it out to the other counties in Florida, and then a decision will be made from there as far as other states are concerned. We don't have a specific timetable because we can't, uh, but it, it's, it needs to be, and we're all in agreement, it needs to be sooner rather than later. Chip Osowski, WFLA TV. I don't know who wants to answer this, but I heard the word controversial. What about this plan is controversial in your mind? Why would somebody not be on board? To me, it's not controversial. It shouldn't. There should be no option. You know, every sheriff in this country and everybody who operates a county jail 
should want the same thing, and that is to make sure that criminal illegals who are wreaking havoc in the communities, repeatedly committing crime, don't get out on the street, and that we partner with ICE so that they can do their job and remove them from the country, and hopefully they stay out of here. But as we see time and time again with the example Sheriff Judd gave, with the examples we have here and the examples we see every day, is they keep coming back. And as long as we have porous borders, we're going to continue to have this problem. So it requires a lot of different things uh, to make this effective. And we can do our part. We can uh, affect our piece. But there's other things that need to come together with this. And so what may be controversial about criminal illegals, there isn't anything, Chip, that I can think of. And because this is not about, and where the, the controversy comes up, to me, the, the, the core of the immigration debate the dilemma that some people have are people who are here illegally but have not committed crime. Um, and there's room for discussion about that. And there's a wide spectrum of discussion that could be had on that. But when it comes to criminal illegals, there should be no discussion. There should be no debate. There should be no hesitation. There should be no, no consideration. Is they need to go and they need to stay gone. And we should all be committed to that. So to the extent that people have concern about the other bucket, have that debate, and Congress needs to make some decisions on it. But in the meantime, ICE's job, our job, is to enforce the law. And that's what we're all committed to doing. Next question, yes? Catherine Barn from the Tampa Bay Times. This is for Mr. Holman. Now, Mr. Holman actually is oh. not taking questions during the press conference. Mr. Alvin, oh, I'm I sorry. No problem. Um, so a lot of this is centered around undocumented immigrants with long criminal histories or committing violent crime or both. But in this current national landscape, um, there's uh, understandably concern the bar is lower, that this could affect non-vital offenders with little or no history. So is there a system of prioritization for how ICE will roll out this new detainer method, and how will you, how, how, does, that, how does that prioritization work? ICE has always prioritized our resources. We have limited number of officers, limited number of resources. We continually prioritize our resources on public safety threats, national security threats, and those individuals that pose the greatest threats to our communities. In FY17, 92% of the people that we arrested and removed from this country had either a criminal conviction, an arrest for a crime, were an individual was here illegally, removed, and unlawfully re-entered, which is a federal felony, or was a fugitive, meaning they had received an order of removal from an immigration judge after exhausting all due process, and were ordered removed and failed to comply with that removal order. This doesn't change how we do our work with regard to our prioritization. What it does change is it enables our officers to take custody of these criminal aliens in the safe confines of a county jail without them being released to the street to re-offend and re-victimize our communities. Next question? Last call? Great, we'll break off. One, one in the back. Oh, one in the back. Sorry. Um, Stephanie Claysmore with Bay News 9. Can you just further explain how this is different from what the courts ruled unconstitutional in the past? So, what the uh, courts in the past, uh, beginning in 2014, had an issue with is the authority of sheriffs to make independent decisions to hold people in custody based upon a civil immigration violation. And what the court said is that even though we had done it for the last 25 plus years, when the analysis was done of the regulations and of the law, the courts then held in 2014 that we didn't have that authority. And so what we're doing today and what we're doing going forward is, is that we are not making that decision. Uh, ICE is making its, the decision within its authority. It, we're acting under color of federal law. And we are holding these people after ICE has made the decision because they have probable cause, they have a warrant, and they're booking them into our jail. This is no different than what we do across the country every day in housing agreements that we have with the U.S. Marshal Service where we hold their arrestees from DEA, from the FBI, and other federal law enforcement agencies. So this is very different uh, from what the courts had an issue with because the sheriffs are not acting in our capacity and making decisions to hold these people so there's no Fourth Amendment issue. And the decision that's being made by ICE is fully compliant with the Fourth Amendment because they have probable cause, there's a warrant, and they're booking them into the jail. And ICE is making the warrant instead of the sheriff's office is holding them? ICE, ICE issues the warrant, uh, which is referred to as the I-200 or I-205, the two forms, 
And that warrant is a validly issued warrant. It's based upon probable cause. And then when ICE serves that warrant to us, we hold the person in jail because they're also given us a booking form that's based on the contract. So we're not making any decisions. ICE is making the decision and we're housing them and we're being paid a fee for housing them, which is consistent with what we do across the board in a whole bunch of contexts every single day. So it's very different than what the courts had a problem with. And I'll, I'll say this again, is that this is lawful, it's legal, it's consistent with federal law, but the absolute best solution to this problem is for Congress to do something, for Congress to act. But Congress isn't going to act. And so since they're not going to act, we're going to act because we cannot continue to do what we're doing and have sheriffs faced with a situation of putting illegals on the street or run the risk of getting sued and having six-figure judgments. No sheriff in this country should be faced with making that decision and have that dilemma. So we're going to fix it. And I would encourage Congress to do something about it in the long term but probably not going to happen. So we're going to handle it ourselves so that we can make sure that communities stay safe, these criminal illegals don't get released to the street, and that our partners in ICE don't have to chase the guy down the street, get in a car chase, get in a shootout, and end up in a bad situation where they can easily just take custody of these people who, again, are repeat offenders who are in and out of the criminal justice system all the time. And we don't have to keep spending resources in having them continually commit crimes in our communities. Last question. You, sorry, I don't want to repeat if there's another one. I'll take one. Hey, I'm, I'm Tess Sheets. I'm with uh, USA Today Network. So these are individuals, illegal individuals, that have been convicted of crimes, and the warrants will be issued on those individuals, not, not individuals that have just been charged. So, some of these people, uh, as you can see by the examples that I've given here and the example Sheriff Judd gave, and we can give a whole myriad of examples, is that some of these people have a lengthy history of committing crime in this country where they've been arrested on state or federal charges. The warrants that ICE issues are either uh, a warrant of arrest that is based on probable cause, and the probable cause is the person is an alien, and that they're removable. And that's the probable cause that ICE establishes, and then they have probable cause to take them into custody. The other one, the I-205, the other arrest warrant, is a warrant of deportation or a warrant of removal that's been issued by an immigration judge where the judge has said, you need to go. And those warrants stay in effect in perpetuity. But this is where the people, even after a judge has said, and as you can see by the examples of the boards that to my left, is the judges have issued those arrest warrants, those 205s, and, and said, you need to go. Uh, but they keep coming back. In the example Sheriff Judd gave, and that's the problem with this, is, is that we need to get them out of here, but they need to stay out, and that couples with the issue about the porous borders, and it all needs to come together because we got to stop these people from coming back in, otherwise we're on the hamster wheel, but at least when we are able to turn them over to ICE and they're able to keep throwing them out, at least they're not out there creating crime victims, and you don't have Kate Steinle, and you don't have a Sergio Martinez. But if I could follow up on that, if you come to our attention, if you're here illegally, and you come to our attention by entering the criminal justice system, as the vast majority of people that we arrest do, we are going to take enforcement action against you. So I'll be perfectly clear about that. Yep. Thank you, everyone. That concludes the question and answer period. As I said, if uh, there are any one-on-ones you're interested in, you are more than welcome to approach those sheriffs. But at this time, the press conference is closed. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. 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 Thank